Good morning, good morning. I am looking and um, I am seeing people that I have, some people, a few, that I have not seen during the meetings over the weekend. Um, so I would like to, I'm look, I don't see a Vicki, Damien, you did it yesterday. Can you somehow make, make a sign-in sheet appear? And I, if you've been here before, we've already got your email addresses, but this is your first time here. I just want to know who's here this morning. Typically, I try to write down everybody and, and keep track of you all. Yesterday, it was interesting. I could look out amongst the group. I knew there were 16 people I didn't have email addresses for in the flock note system. I, I know you all. You are my flock. I, I told Rico yesterday, I'm the shepherdess of Chat San Diego County. I have a... <laughs> Rick Lewis understands, I have a shepherding call on me. He has a counseling call on his life. I have a shepherding call on my life. And so you are my flock, and I accepted the flock in San Diego County um, because God's called us to do something. And um, I'm not the leader because I know where we're going. I'm the leader because I'm willing. That's all. I have a shepherdess calling on me. I told Rico yesterday, uh, half my family is Hungarian, and actually down in my mother's family lineage in the Hungarian language, um, Majorul is what you call Hungarian in Hungarian, um, our family name is Pastor, <laughs> P-A-S-Z-T-O-R, Pastor, in Hungarian. So I figured it's a DNA calling on me, and I accept it. Um, it, it comes in handy good for teaching, which is what I was. I was a high school teacher for half of my career. So um, you are my grown-up class. And I, this is a challenge. This is an adventure. We are doing something that you don't know the step in front of you, but it's okay. You know, Rico has this wonderfully a fleshed out plan. And it's, I mean, because he comes from the business world. He comes from like Nickelodeon. He like, he really knows how to do this stuff professionally out there. So he's got this stuff all planned out. And yesterday we were telling him some of the things we'd done and he goes, you guys cheated. <laughs> You're not doing it right. But you know what? God called us. God just moved on people. Like Damien, Damien was chafing about holding back and holding back. And finally he said, I just need to learn this thing. And he went out and he learned how to do the 10 habits. And now he's going to learn how to do from sickness to health. Uh, Vicki was just, she tried to do healthy self book on her own. And it just wasn't working. She said, I'd like a group to do it with me. It, everybody gets called on their own thing. And so I'm just kind of standing on tiptoe excited to see what God is going to do and where he's going to take us. At this point, we do know that we are going to move ahead. Damien's going to learn how to do sickness to health. Vicki and I already know healthy self. We'll keep doing it. We have another healthy self schedule to start in the autumn. If you know <clears throat> people that want to join the 10-day challenge, works really well. It was one of the gifts of COVID. COVID gave us Zoom meetings. So now we're meeting with people in, even in other states, things that we could not do before. So out of, God says, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We know no matter how ugly it looks, God's going to work it together for good for his people. So it's okay. It's all right. Like Rico was saying, I think it was Friday night you started out when you were saying when things look like a failure and that things in Jesus' ministry look like a failure, but they weren't, they weren't. You have to just trust and you move forward. So I'm looking out at you, the faces out here. God's assembling a team. It's like mission impossible. You can choose to accept this or you can choose to not accept it. But I will tell you that if you accept becoming a part of this team, it's going to be the most remarkable experience of walking with God, of walking with God. And to me, it is always um, just so like awe-inspiring, standing back and going, wow, God, I, I see you did that. We couldn't have orchestrated that. Look at that over there. We couldn't have done that, Lord. You did that. What an awe-inspiring thing to just 
walk with God. I saw Bibi, my friend Beatriz, and her daughter Elizabeth, haven't seen them for years. Yesterday they show up. Just these rich friendships and God, um, God friendships and bondings. And in my experience, God calls teams together for different jobs. And it's a different team. And it's a team always that he designs that is for a specific project. And then that project is done, and then he assembles another team for another project. And you will find yourself in and out of many different teams as you walk through your God life. And so I'm just looking at you, and I'm, I'm not overwhelmed. That's not the word I want to say. I am just in awe. I'm in awe, and I'm saying, Oh, look, God, you're pulling together another team. My friend Del Manipal said her sister-in-law Margie had, had signed up and then didn't start it. And here's Margie over here in the front. And she said, I think maybe I'm going to join in this time and I'll do it with Margie. Margie's just way back, hadn't even barely started. She just paid probably eight months ago, something like that. But God's timing is perfect. So don't feel like, Oh, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late, or I didn't do this. Jamie said it took three, three years to finish chat, but her heart was right. Her heart was in the right place. So be gentle with God and with his leading. Um, he's doing something, and I don't know the total answer. I will tell you, um, we hadn't even shared with Rico, but this is kind of where we had gone with chat. So for those of you who, are, who knew and didn't hear all the pieces, 24 people signed up for chat online training when we did this started about three years ago. Of those 24 people, 11 have finished, completed the, the whole 60 hours of training. And then I have 13 left of my little flock. Now I need to gather you, collect you up, and let's get you um, to the finish line. But there are some other people who will be joining us now. But let me take you back. What happened when maybe about half a dozen of us had finished chat, we started looking around and saying, OK, what's next? And Leslie connected with Rico to find out about the next level of training. But we were in the middle of COVID. That didn't work out. So we kind of did some other things. Leslie gave us some really good training in how to reach out to organizations in, in San Diego and find out what their goals were and find the organizations that had health goals so we could find where we could fit into their health goals. And so we started doing that. But that wasn't the only thing we did. We decided we were going to get together in groups, and we had a South County group of chat, and an East County group of chat, and a Central San Diego County group, group of chat. And we started just meeting weekly. And I ran the East County chat group. And in South County, um, the only person we had who was willing to run it was Dr. Dan Rogers, who owns the Baja Health and Wellness Clinic in Playas de Tijuana. Um, he actually would be here today, but he has a patient, so he has to be there at the clinic. Um, he sends his apologies to Rico and to the rest because he would like to be here. So Dr. Rogers and his wife Sally ran the South County group, and they were meeting weekly. But Dr. Rogers hadn't heard Rico's thing about cycle of engagement. He had not, he, he didn't have that particular picture, but he was willing to lead. He was the health ministries leader at Chula Vista Church, and they have a very strong health ministries group there. Uh, and Central San Diego, even though we have a, a pastor who's actually uh, completed the chat training, Pastor Stephen Henderson of New Hope Church has completed it, but we didn't find that key person who would be willing to be the shepherd of that particular flock. So Leslie stepped in and he um, tried to run it for a while. They had difficulty getting a time that was good for all of them to meet. But so meanwhile, we had South County was meeting weekly, East County was meeting weekly. In East County, that's kind of where all this started. And we, we connected with the El Cajon Collaborative. Um, we tried to just reach out. We were we were doing research to find what organizations are out there that actually have health goals. And I want you to know, I said this, I think, Friday night, but I want you to know there is a group in San Diego called Live Well San Diego. 
it is a huge grant funded uh, organization. It has been in San Diego for probably 12 years now. Their first 10 years, th their whole goal was to raise the level of health of people in San Diego County. They had something called like, it was 543, I, I, I'm gonna get it a little garbled, but it's like five behaviors cause um, four diseases that cause these three deaths in San Diego County. And the number was maybe 60% of the deaths in San Diego County were attributable to things that could be corrected by changing behavior. I mean, Live Well San Diego knew that. They're not Adventists. And they started working on that. They were able to lower the death rate by 10% over 10 years working on that. They're doing it as a funded agency, but the way you do it is with partnerships, just the way God does it, just the way God's doing this, people reaching out together. And so Live Well San Diego has about 500 partners all out there doing their own things in health that are reaching out to somehow, in one aspect or another, make the health of San Diego be better, lift it up. So we were able to decrease the death rate from those particular things in the first 10 years. Now they're moving on, they have a set of goals for the next 10 years. So Live Well San Diego, if you're involved in, in medical missionary work or the community health advocacy work here in San Diego, they are someone to know about. They are an entity to know about. I encourage you to go out and just do an internet search on Live Well San Diego, see what you can find out about them because they are the main person that is doing this, and they have all the partners. The El Cajon Collaborative that we are members of, it's one of their many 500 partners. So that's kind of what we were doing during the, um, as some of us graduated from CHAT. We started meeting in these three areas. So Central San Diego didn't really have, a, a leader did not appear, and so that kind of just lay dormant. Southern was Dr. Rogers, and then Eastern was me. Um, as we went into Healthy Self with Vicki, then we kind of, we were meeting every week then for the Healthy Self, and so we fell out of doing the East County Zoom meetings for our East County chat people. But I'm just letting you know, it's not like we had a plan already, it's like we were going one step at a time. Whatever God put in front of us, okay, we're going to go that one step. That's all I can see, but I'll step into the step he's put before me. So we did that for a while, and then we went to Healthy Self, but pretty much so that we'd been meeting weekly. Um, towards today, it was, is today here this morning? Yes. <laughs> today, after, after she did, maybe it was after we did Healthy Self once or something like that, and we hadn't been doing East County meetings, and so she goes, so Carol, what are we doing next? <laughs> where, where are we going? Where are we moving? Thinking, uh, I don't know today, but uh, okay, well, let's meet and talk. She and I got on and we had a like business meeting, a chat business meeting. I think it went an hour and a half. And she's saying, well, we need, we can't just keep doing healthy self over and over and over again. You know, where are we going? What are we going to do? And so she kind of pushed me and we reconvened. We got a the group together again, but one of the things Denise Avedia was saying, you know, I think we need to meet as a whole group. It's this doing South County and East County and Central is, is a little too fragmented for a very small band of people, which was only, you know, like three, 13 and 13 that hadn't graduated and 10 that had. So I think if we head back to something, we'll try getting the chat people together, but on a county level, we have discovered that pretty much we're doing South San Diego County. The only representatives we have from North San Diego County are Miranda uh, and her daughter Crystal are at Vista Spanish Church. But other than that, all the other churches that are participating, and there are 10 churches out of the three dozen churches in San Diego County, Adventist churches, 10 of them have people who are involved in chat. Yes, Dennis. Dennis says he just saw an article on his phone this morning how COVID-19 has changed people's ideas about health and their interest in healthy living. Isn't that the truth? 
So anyway, now you have kind of an idea of where we've been and where we are now. So I guess I will try to reconvene some total Zoom meetings. We're pretty much South County with Miranda and her daughter, Crystal. Convene some meetings. Uh, if you are wanting to join the chat train, if God is calling you, then just let me know. We'll work it out for you to get on and start with the new people that are coming. Plan for the next year is that we will... Um, Vicki and I have got healthy self down. Damien's going to learn a new thing. He did the 10 habits. Now he's going to learn from sickness to health. And then I'm going to explore the third piece that we have that we haven't done yet is the monthly meetings with people in the community for a plant-based meal. We haven't tried that, but we have a connection with Cornell University and a Dr. T. Colin Campbell's group, Plant-Based Nation, the Center for Nutrition Studies. They have they have a program that does monthly plant-based get-togethers for dinner all over the world. What do you know? And I got a certificate with them last January. So maybe that's the train God's going to have us get on and meet people because we're supposed to mingle. So I guess uh, my, my closing thought to you is mingle, mingle. Get out and mingle. I, you know, I didn't. You have a job, you have a family, you have church activities, and you just keep doing that. You keep doing that. And chat forced me to get out of my this. It forced me to get out and really be involved in the community in a way I had not before. So all I can say is talk to God, go with him, mingle, because that's what we've been told to do, what Jesus did. Go out and mingle with the people and meet their needs. And God's going to let you know what your part is in this. Thank you all for being here this morning. Yes. Seventy-seven people watched on YouTube over the weekend and 70 on Facebook. 70 on Facebook, 77 on YouTube. So when we started out Friday night and it was not a lot of people, I just felt this huge energy connecting with the camera, and I thought, there we are in television land. I'm talking to you, my people. You are out there. And I just, I felt like it was. I felt like I was on TV. And it really happened. So 77 and 70. God is good. He has a plan. Amen. Ah, I'm on. Good morning, everyone. A happy Sunday to you. How are you feeling? Did you rest well? Yeah? Good, good. Who's here for the first time today? Yes, yes, yes. This is the grandson of my friend Gwen Basilla. I'm so happy she's here. We go way back. Uh, she's a member of this church, but uh, doesn't get here as often as she like. But I'm so happy to see you here today. She went through the training that um, Carol has been talking about back in 2011. And you don't mind me telling your age, do you? She's 91. Oh, praise the Lord. She believes in this message. She lives this message. And she has the evidence. So I'm so excited that you're here today. I'm also excited that you're here today. Today we're going to do From Sickness to Health. This is kind of a sort of a, a practice, if you will. Not for me, but for you. In other words, I'm going to show you basically what we do once we start to talk to the community. What you saw Friday night and through Sabbath was basically when I'm speaking to, you know, you guys. You know, I use my Bible, I use the spirit of prophecy, I use everything available to me to communicate the message. But when I'm doing um, something for the community that you like what you'll be doing, you do something that's more going to be straight science, research, and with a bit of chatting involved, included, if you understand what I mean. In other words, we use the things that are most familiar to help people to understand the things that is not so familiar to them, like a new heart. So we do a little presentation called When Hearts Attack. So that's what we're going to share this morning. I want to just kind of uh, welcome those who are joining us from live stream. I'm happy to hear that so many uh, were able to tune in over the weekend. Pray that you've received a blessing and that that blessing would continue today as we continue to think on these things. And I want to just endorse 
and reaffirm uh, Carol in her appeal to you, take up the mantle, pick it up, grab it, go forward. Um, we have a work to do. I have a few goodies, some things I brought with me, some books that I wrote. Some of you are familiar with them. These go way back, Sister Gwen, back to when we were in Arizona. But this particular one right here is 10 Secrets to Living 10 Times Better. It is sort of a, a bridge version of the Healthy Self book. It's a great witnessing book that's in smaller, a uh, little smaller package, um, and you can just kind of go through it quickly with people. Sometimes people buy them. I'm on my way to Hawaii, and there they purchase these, and they, they use them as something that they give out to people. Um, certainly these come in handy. These, these are Natural Remedies Handbook 1 and Handbook 2, shows you how to do things like strengthen your immune system and use things that are in your cupboard, in your refrigerator, and in your pantry. So these will be available. They asked me to bring these to make them available to you, so I brought a few of those. All right? Okay, so <clears throat> let's begin, shall we? Can we start with a word of prayer? Is, let me ask a question before I pray. Anyone here in this sanctuary who's not a member of the Adventist church? Anybody here who's not a member of any church, of any denomination? All right, so I'm talking to people who, who know the Lord. Okay, that, that helps. That's helpful for me. And for those of you who are joining via live stream, this, there is no requirement that you be Adventist. There's no requirement that you be even Christian. It's just that you have a passion for your health and the health of other people. All right, so, but what we're going to do is we're going to start with a word of prayer as we get started. Let's pray. Loving Father and our God, we thank you for this beautiful day here in San Diego once again. And as we continue our weekend and study and learning together, we pray that you would be amongst us. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Curious title, When Hearts Attack. You know, oftentimes people, when they have a heart attack, and you should know that every 30 seconds or less, someone has a heart attack somewhere in this country for sure because heart disease is the number one killer in America. It's number one. It remains number one, has been number one for a very long time. Um, but heart disease is rampant throughout the world. In the From Sickness to Health um, five-day seminar, this comes on night number two. Why? Strategically, when we are reaching out to the community, we need to lead with that which is most relevant. And everyone, but everyone, knows someone who has had some sort of cardio episode, some type of a heart attack, some type of issue with heart disease. So we want to make sure that we stay relevant, right? So Night two, we go right in and we share some of these wonderful things that people need to know and understand, right? So, the main message, next slide, the main message that we want people to know, first and foremost, is that you, listen, are fearfully, what am I going to say next? And wonderfully made. The psalmist says, I will praise thee because... I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and truly you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I put this little slide in because there's so much that I can tell you about melanopsin. Melanopsin is something that is so powerful. It's a blue light sensing protein. <laughs> you, you all know what a protein is, right? Proteins is what every living thing on this planet is made of. Everything is made of amino acids which produce is what you get, what makes up proteins. Testing? Okay. But I went out for a second there. Uh, but this is a protein that's in the body that senses blue light. And the blue light, see, first of all, you need to understand that you are rhythmic. In other words, you have a rhythm in your system, not just your heart. You know, your heart is beating on a rhythm, on a timing. It's paced in a certain way. When that goes off, 
you know, you can get a pacemaker, right? But it is according to a clock. And people don't realize it's, that you are full of clocks. You are full of time. You have a timer, a clock that's at the base of your brain that's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I know that's a big $10 word. However, it is what it's called, or for short, the SCN, suprachiasmatic nucleus. It is the master clock of all clocks. Oh, wait a minute, you've got more than one clock. Yes, you do. You have a master clock that's at the base of your brain, and then you have peripheral clocks. Peripheral meaning you have secondary, tertiary clocks throughout your body. Your liver has a clock. Your heart has a clock. Your, um, your, your, your pancreas has a clock. Your kidneys, they also have clocks. All of them have their own clocks, but they're all regulated by the master clock. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's be very clear about that. And I share this with you and you who are at home because you need to understand that you're not something that came from um, some mollusk or some sort of thing that came out of a pro um, some sort of a evolutionary soup that, that happened. No, you are actually designed perfectly and I'm amazed, listen to me very carefully. I'm amazed that when people examine the human body and they have recently and saw, wait a minute, this body, John, is full of clocks. I don't know where your mind goes, but my mind goes back to when people were trying to prove the, the foolishness of evolution, they would say, well, you know, evolution or this universe coming into being and everything that's created in it would be akin to taking a bunch of scrap parts and throwing them down or exploding them and then when the dust settled you had before you a grandfather clock or a watch not gonna happen but now we find science has shown that you are full of clocks and you are on time you like that you are on time. And all of your timing is based on the circadian rhythm of the light and dark or sun and darkness, right? So during the day, you are building up serotonin right now. But as soon as that sun starts to set, then your body is going to start to secrete melatonin. You all knew that, right? And it's going to say, it's time to go to sleep, right? Next slide. So I just wanted to just... Just let you know that there's things that you can look into. Confucius said something. He said, you have two lives. And the second begins when you realize we only have one. So what does that mean to you right now? What that means to you right now is that you have one life right now. Live it to the best of your ability. When you have that consciousness, that you have this life to live, live it to the best of your ability and take care of everything that God has designed. Next slide. Now I'm gonna give you some little facts here. Um, just to kind of warm up the pump here, stewardess. Stewardess, remember we used to call flight attendants that? Well, it happens to be the longest word you can type with only your left hand. <laughs> Next slide. Here's another one. Lollipop. Lollipop is the longest word you can type with only your right hand. Now here's a COVID-19 fun fact. Next slide. 87% of gym members didn't even know that the gym was closed. <laughs> Let me tell you something, friends. Your heart loves you. Next slide. Your heart loves you more than anyone or anything else. Why would I say that? Your heart loves you because it will beat for you. The heart beats 100,000 times per day. Yeah, take that in. 30 million times in a year. 2.5 billion times in a 70-year-old lifetime. My friend Gwen here is 91 years old. 
Now you do the math, how long her heart has been beating. But we find that the human heart was designed to beat forever. So why doesn't it beat forever? Or for 91 years? Or for some people, 70 years? Or for some people, 84 years? Why doesn't it? Because people don't realize the importance of taking care of this amazing machinery, and yes, it is a machine. And that machine called the human body, it is the only machinery on the planet that wears down when you don't use it. Did you hear what I just said? It's the only thing that breaks down when you don't use it. Cars, you can use them and then you'll retire them. Airplanes, you'll fly them and then they have to retire them. Trains, you'll have to retire them at some point. But the human body is the only thing that functions like a machine in this intricate, very complex way. And yet, when you don't use it, it does the opposite of every other machine. It breaks down. It begins to rust over. So I want to just walk you through and talk about this machine that is the heart that loves you more than anything else. It will keep beating for you. It will never listen, listen, listen. It will never attack you. The problem is, is that most people soon learn that they've been attacking their heart all their lives. And your heart just takes the abuse. It takes the abuse and more abuse and more abuse and more abuse. But eventually, it will stop. Next slide. Let's see if we can see this video. I don't know if we can or not because of the setup we have here, but we'll try. Can we go to the next slide and see if that video will play? If it doesn't, we'll just keep on going. Ah, there it is. So here it is, the heart. Can you see that? It's about the size of a fist, right? It's about the size of a man's fist. And this thing beats and will beat and beat without anything plugged into it. And there's electrical currents going through it. Oh my, and you're not plugged into anything. Fluid, just biology and chemistry is creating electrical shocks that are going through the heart at all times. Right now, you are experiencing this and most people don't even know it. The heart is fearfully and wonderfully made. And don't even forget that it actually has its own clock system. Now, the heart starts beating early, early on. I won't get into that debate, but it starts very early on. Within weeks of conception, that heart starts to beat and a hummingbird, a hummingbird's heart beats, our heart beats every couple seconds, but they have about a 20 or so beats within a second. The gray whale has the largest heart, hummingbird has one of the smallest hearts, and the gray whale's heart is about the size of a, a golf cart. Daniel gives us some of the first research on the heart and health. In the book of Daniel, we see that a plant-based diet was the thing. Exercising is the best way to keep your heart healthy. Um, and if you don't exercise, like relying on something else, like, you know, your car or even, you know, racing in a horse, like at the Belmont Park races, where this man, Frank Hayes, he actually won the Belmont Stakes and on his way across the finish line, he suffered a massive heart attack and he died. Rest in peace, Frank Hayes. Moral of the story, don't let your horse be healthier than you. He'll finish and you won't. And that was the case there. But I have to tell you about some people, next slide, who have really healthy hearts. Like my friend Gwen here, the people who are in the blue zones, <clears throat> excuse me, have very healthy hearts, they have healthy livers, they have healthy kidneys, they have healthy lungs, they have health because they live a certain way. They suffer less heart attacks, less hypertension, less diabetes, and there are five blue zones. Do you know where they are? 
Do you know where they are without looking up on the screen? Okinawa, Japan has the healthiest or longest living women, right? Sardinia, Italy has the longest living men up there in the highlands. You have Ikaria, Greece. You have uh, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. And then right north of you all here in San Diego is Loma Linda, California. Yes, yes. You have the longest living, longest living people, the highest concentration of centenarians, octagarians, and what do they call people who live in their 90s? Nonagonarians, nonagonarians, right, there you go. They are concentrated in Loma Linda, California, and I think I mentioned that I plan on doing a documentary, if all goes well, that will be on uh, these five blue zones as we will travel to all of them and we will see what makes them so special. Of course, we, what we will find in Loma Linda is that it is a blessing to actually park your car one day a week, isn't it? When you don't, you're, you're looking at me sideways. You park your heart. You take a rest. You take a Sabbath break. Any car that has less miles is going to have more mileage to go. Is that right? So we see that that is the case with, in, uh, with Loma Linda, with the, um, those who live in the Loma Linda area, and there's something special to be learned from them. Is that right? Amen. Of course. The um, next slide, the National Geographic, they got very interested in, um, in those living in blue zones. And they looked and they said the residents of these places produce a high rate of centenarians, suffer a fraction of the diseases that commonly kill people in other parts of the developed world, and they enjoy more years of good health. I love the story of Dr. Uh, what, what was his name? Doctor, he was a he was a cardiologist, a heart surgeon. Wareham, I think it was Wareham, Dr. Wareham. He was doing surgeries. He was there, part of that that cohort there in uh, Loma Linda, and he was doing heart surgery up until he was 95 years old. 95. He retired at 95, and he had a steady hand. He had a good heart. He had good nerves because why? As they looked at all those five blue zones, there was something common among them. They had a plant-based diet. They exercised normally and regularly. They drank plenty of water. In other words, they followed the health principles that we find in our new life uh, example. So, uh, he died at like 102, but everyone became very interested in him, certainly because um, they were talking about, uh, this was how they introduced him on one of the morning shows. They said, this is Dr. Wareham, and um, he uh, wanted to put a fence around his property, and the, gave, the people who gave him a bid, it was way too expensive, so he decided, you know what, I'm going to go and build the fence myself, right? You saw that? <laughs> And he goes to build, and they said he started, and they had a picture of him, and he's putting the poles in. They said, but then that evening, he ended up in the emergency room. Not because he was suffering any type of episode, but because he was performing heart surgery at 95 years of age. Yes, yes. And then there was Mars Jaton. Mars Jaton, she lived until she was 107 years old. And the, the one who sort of made popular the phrase Blue Zone, um, his name is um, Dan Buettner. Dan Buettner, who was the author and the researcher, the anthropologist within, with the National Geographic, he took a ride with Marjaton when she was 100. She still had her driver's license, Elizabeth, <laughs> at 107. And he said one of the most fearful things I've ever experienced was driving down the five freeway with Marjaton. <laughs> she still was exercising, working out, and had her driver's license, as I mentioned. And it is a blessing to know these principles of health. Next slide. Ah, good, good, good. Let's get some five habits that add years to your life. Here they are, number one. Number one, 
Number one, there they are. Healthy diet. Exercise, I mentioned this. Maintain ideal weight. Avoid alcohol. Avoid smoking. Right? That's all you need to do. And there's a gentleman. Next slide. There's a gentleman who really outlined these in his book, Undo It and Reversing Heart Disease. His name is Dr. Dean Ornish. Anybody know who Dean Ornish is? Oh, you need to know about Dean Ornish. You know about him? Dean Ornish, you know about him? Well, the beautiful thing about Dean Ornish is after, I think I have a video. Maybe I should just save it for the video, but I'm going to keep pressing through. I'll give you a little bit of a preview anyway. Uh, Dean Ornish was, is, is a wonderful doctor who's done seminal work on heart disease, reversing heart disease, and reversing um, prostate cancer in men. Yeah. But after Bill Clinton had his heart episode, you remember Bill Clinton? He's not too far removed, is he? You remember how you used to see Bill Clinton always jogging, you know? And it was like, wow, he's the healthiest president we've ever had. Little did we know he was always jogging to McDonald's, right? He loved, he loved an apple pie milkshake, and he loved the quarter pound burger. That was his favorite thing. And it eventually caught up with him because that activity was attacking his heart, and he didn't know it. And eventually he had that episode, and it was all over the news, fully covered, Bill Clinton is in the hospital, he's having stents put in, et cetera, et cetera. And, <clears throat> and it was amazing that the doctors told him something. I'll save that for just a few moments. But Dean Ornish was the doctor who worked with him. Yeah, so Dean Ornish really sort of echoed the same idea. Eat well, next slide. Eat well, move more, stress less. That's where we get it from, right? Um, trust more and stress less. And he says, love more. Love more. How do you like that? Do you really like that? Let me tell you why I like that. Loving is good for you. Loving is good for your heart. And guess what? Can I take it a step further? Loving your heart is even better. In other words, recognizing that this thing beats for you on time every day while you're sleeping. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing, and it loves you and will keep doing it as long as you follow the principles that we're talking about. Does that make sense to you? Next slide. So love your heart more. I think this is a video in the next slide. I like to show videos because when we're doing this kind of thing, Carol, with with an audience, you know, we can say things and, you know, people will wonder, well, are you a doctor, right? Who are you to be telling us these things, right? So what we do, and we train people, and you know this, if you've gone through chat, we put videos, we embed them, next slide if you don't mind, up there, next. If, what we do is we put, embed them in the presentations and we just let the doctor say it. I talk and about And one of the doctors is, before, is Sanjay Gupta. But the evidence just got even stronger for food as medicine. Cleveland Clinic researchers have now confirmed that food can heal your heart. Their study published in the journal Family Practice found that a plant-based diet not only prevents heart attacks, but can actually reverse the damage. First of all, out of the patients who tried the vegan diet, almost nine out of 10 stuck with it. 81% had fewer symptoms and experienced fewer complications from heart disease. A whopping 22% reverse signs of heart disease. And the participants lost almost 20 pounds each on average. You have some easy to remember adages about how people can decide what they should or should not eat. We know what they shouldn't eat. That is <laughs> oil, dairy, meat, fish, and chicken. What do we want them to eat? We want them to eat all those whole grains for their cereal bread and pasta, beans, vegetables, <laughs> yellow, red, green, and fruit. Now what particular vegetables do we want them to have? Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard greens, beet greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And I'm out of breath. <laughs> now the mantra is, eat nothing that has a mother or a face. Dr. Esselstyn and other researchers insist if you stick to that advice, you won't have a heart attack in the first place. Boom. Drop the mic. There you go. Now, I don't know, he went through that litany of things very quickly. 
But if you were listening very carefully, you probably heard something. You may have heard something that I talked about yesterday. Or was it Friday? I don't know. Did you hear it? Mustard greens, turnip greens, cabbage, cruciferous vegetables, greens. All of that was in there. Now, you may have heard him say something about oil and said, wait a minute, I use oil all the time. And Carol, you kind of alluded to um, that we cook with oil. Um, I want to mention something. Dr. Caldwell Edson, his program is magnificent. I know at least two people who have actually gone through his program. They were nearly on their deathbed. They could not move very far or walk anywhere without taking some sort of medication. Their heart was just that weak. So when you have, I'm trying to give some context for you, when you have a physician who's dealing with people like that who will otherwise die, you got to get them off oil. If you don't have that as a problem, it's not as big an issue for you. So we need to make sure that we're clear because sometimes we hear that information and we hear the success they're having and then what we do is he said we get confused and say well I need to get rid of oil why are you cooking with oil right and the reality is when you have doctors who specialize in something and they're having success you need to make sure that you're looking at it within the context that they're saying it right now I will say I will say though that certain oils you need to stay away from for your heart health palm oil Coconut oil, I've seen the research. Uh, I work with Dr. Hannah Kaliova. She just lectured at our church. She has all the science. Um, <clears throat> olive oil is better. Uh, grapeseed oil is better. But palm oil is in a lot of your cookies and cakes and pies and is destroying your heart. Causing inflammation of the heart, not only inflammation of the heart, but also inflammation of the brain, which causes all types of cognitive degenerative neurological diseases as well, Alzheimer's, dementia. Coconut oil is not good for you to be taking. I know they are. I just saw it. And it, it, they're in the clinical trials right now. Not good. Coconut is great. Well, you know, you have to understand, you have to understand, and a lot, by the way, uh, you know, let me just say this, I don't want to discourage you. <laughs> All things in moderation, Mark Twain said, including moderation. <laughs> but let me just, let me just encourage you. When we go to a plant-based diet, and we should, and you go to some of these places are serving it up very quickly like in a fast food style and you mm -hmm. can get the, the vegan pizzas and the vegan cheeseburgers that are using the Beyond Burger, all those things, you know, while they're trying to do better for us, they're really at the end of the day, they're trying to make money. You understand that, right? It's industry, it's industry, it's industry. So someone asked me and Dr. Kaliova, when we were giving this lecture two weeks ago in Maryland, they said, well, what should we do? Should we eat the Beyond Burgers and the Impossible Burgers or not? And should we put on there the Dyer cheese, which is delicious, <laughs> right? They have perfected it. It melts in everything. For us in these last days of Earth's history, do that which is simplest from the hand of God. If you can take some nuts, provided you do not have any type of nut allergy, and you can take some nuts, and you can take a grain like oats, or lentils, or something else, and you can create and make your own burger, from which if you bought a thing of oats, you know, a couple pounds of it, I usually buy it by like 25 pound bags, and you make your own and take an afternoon or a morning to do it and you'll end up with 30, 40 burgers for just a few dollars versus 10 burgers from Costco for $14 for Beyond Burger? Do the math. And you know the ingredients, you know what's in it. And then the final thing on the cheese. The cheese, 
Um, many of the cheeses, they have palm oil. Palm oil is a big offender. Right? Say it again. It's an... There you go. So you got to be careful. Let's keep going. Here's some scientific research. This is amazing research right here. So the Journal of the American Medical Association, they found, they looked at 300 autopsies of, of American casualties, and the average was 22 years of age, right? Just 22 years of age, and they looked and they found that 77% had visible evidence of coronary atherosclerosis. And you know what that is. That's the hardening of the arteries, right? This was from a 1953 study. Now, what does that mean? 22-year-olds already were starting to have heart disease, but the bad news gets worse. This was a more recent study in 1981, and they looked again at accidental death victims, and they were between the ages of 3 and 26, and they found the first stage of atherosclerosis, that's the fatty streaks, found in nearly all American children. By what age do you see it there? By age 10, by age 10, I like and I follow Dr. Um, Michael Greger. Um, he wrote the book, How Not to Die. And in his book, he wrote something that really caught my attention. He says, the question isn't whether or not you want to eat healthier to prevent heart disease, but whether or not you want to reverse the heart disease you already have. Catch that? It's amazing to me, too. It's amazing. It really is amazing to me because I've watched, you know, people who, I'm going to tell you something right here. I'm going to let you in on something. Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? I'm going to let you in on something. I have watched people who were really, really healthy now. But see, I discovered something. Those same people who are really healthy now, they suffered a heart attack. And I began to scratch my head. They worked out. They ate right, they believed the message, and they died, right? So then I started to go back and do some research. And then I realized that what we do in our 20s, because we think we're invincible in our 20s, and we just go for it, whatever, anything goes, right? Stay up all night long, you know, eat what you want. Life will continue, and it will never cease to end. Then in your 30s, you start to feel some aches and pains. By the time you get to your 40s, you get diagnosed for something. By the time you're in your 40s, 50s, then you are now taking a prescription for that thing. And then by the time you get into your 60s, you will either die from it or your life will begin to spiral down the downward path to death. When did it start? 20s. But now, according to this, as early as 10. So that means that if you, wherever you are right now, you have to be aggressive. So then I realized that those people who, like I know a pastor who recently died, and I knew for this guy was going for another 20 years, it shocked everyone that he just flat out had a massive heart attack, and I've seen it happen again and again. Well, it turns out he wasn't exercising as much as everyone thought. It's a struggle. I know that I'm not going to pretend like every day I'm hitting the gym. But I know it's something that I got to do four times a week, right? That's the recommended thing, to keep that heart healthy. So wherever you are, you need to look at those laws and principles of health and say, where am I? What am I doing? What am I not doing? Because if you're not even doing one of those things, I tell you, remember what the research says, keeping your ideal weight eating a plant-based diet or a diet that is full of the vitamins and minerals and, you know, phytonutrients and all of the necessary enzymes and antioxidants that you need in your body, drinking plenty of water because you don't drink water, then the blood sluggish. It, slug it becomes very sluggish and it doesn't move through the system. And therefore, you end up with problems that way as well. So all of these things matter. Notice this video. And I'm so thankful to you guys up there in the booth. You got the videos going so they get to see the full effect. Thank you so much. Can you all give a hearty amen to what they're doing up there? Amen, amen. Let's look at this next video. It really puts it into perspective 
through an animation. I like these kind of things. You'll find them in documentaries, and I like the Over way Over 17 million them. people die every year from cardiovascular disease. It is the leading cause of death around the world. Nearly one out of every three people will die from this disease. The amount of people who die from cardiovascular disease is the equivalent of four jumbo jets crashing every single hour, every single day, every single year. That was jumbo jets crashing every single day, every single hour. Now see, that really puts it into perspective. And see, at the time when people were suffering from COVID and uh, this number of deaths every day, this number of deaths every day, right? And it was like, wait a minute though, this has been going on for a while now and we never made a big deal of the fact that people were dying in these kind of numbers just from you know, from heart disease and heart attacks, right? Now, let me get to the root of the problem. Let's look at the problem. So here was an article that was in the um, Associated Press, and it looked at mummies from Egypt, right? They exhumed the bodies, yeah, they exhumed the bodies from, from, from these sarcophaguses and from these tombs, and they took them through this high-tech equipment that we go through and we can look at, you know, what's going on inside the body so they can still look and see what, what type of diseases these, these mummies had. Now, let me ask you a question first. Does anyone know the life expectancy of Egyptians when they were, with all the advanced technology and mathematics and architecture and physics and engineering that they had. Does anyone know what the life, expecting, life expectancy was for these very, very smart, brilliant people? <laughs> She's exactly right. In the book of Genesis, if you're correct, the Pharaoh saw Jacob and he looked at him and he saw him and said, whoa, how old are you? How is that possible that you can reach this age? Because the, the average age of an Egyptian was 40 years of age. 40. Anybody here younger than 40? Raise your hand. Oh, stop showing off. Put your hands down. <laughs> 40 years old was it. So they take these bodies and they put them through this high tech, you know, this technology and they look and they can see the diseases that they had. And what they saw was number one, the number one killer. You ready for this? The number one killer for Egyptians 4,000 years ago was heart disease. And they suffered cancer. They could see the cancerous tumors. Yeah, they could see that too through ultrasound. They could also see that they suffered from diabetes. That means that the, there was nerve damage. They could still see the nerves that were intact through this. And I said to myself, and here's a plug and a high five to God, because God gave them the technology. Watch this. God gave them the technology back then, 4,000 years ago, to be able to preserve a body just so. Why? In 2020. One, 22, we can look at those bodies and see what they died from and say, wow, what was their problem? What were they eating? What were they doing? We can learn from it. You got that? But despite all that information and good information it is, notice what this particular article said. Now I'm getting to the root of the problem why people still fall into this trap. London. Associated Press, even without modern day temptations like fast food or cigarettes, people had clogged arteries some 4,000 years ago, according to the biggest ever hunt for the condition in mummies. 4,000 years ago. Didn't matter that they didn't, have, they didn't have fast food. Didn't matter that they didn't have cigarettes that they smoked. In other words, heart disease has been hunting us. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. It continues. The research suggests that heart disease may be more a part, a natural part. Oh, give it to me again. Researchers suggest that heart disease may be more of a natural part of human aging 
rather than being directly tied to contemporary risk factors like smoking, eating fatty foods, or not exercising. In other words, don't exercise, <laughs> right? Go ahead and smoke, eat your fatty foods, eat, drink, and be merry. Because 4,000 years ago, the research shows us that they weren't doing any of those things and they still had heart disease. But notice, they didn't go into deeply what it was. But let's keep going. Give me the next slide. So here's a quote from the lead author on the paper. He said, heart disease has been stalking. You understand that verb, stalking? That's like a roaring lion that's hiding behind the bushes, waiting for you to pass by, and then it's going to pounce on you, right? Heart disease has been stalking mankind for over 4,000 years all over the globe. Do you hear this terrible, terrible research and information that's being communicated to the world? Now, it's AP. That means it went out to everyone. It went everywhere. And many, many different media outlets picked up this research, and it became the excuse for people to just live as you like. Next slide. Thompson said he was surprised to see hardened arteries, even in people like the ancient Aleutians, who were presumed to have a healthy lifestyle, here it is, as hunters and gatherers. If they were hunting, what were they hunting? So therein lies the problem. They were hunting flesh, they ate the flesh, and the flesh, which will naturally clog your arteries, clogged their arteries. But you wouldn't get that from that article as an understanding because it's distorting things for us. Okay, here's that video. Next slide. Here's that video. Hope you can play it. Here's Sanjay Gupta again. He's talking to Bill Clinton, and I want you to hear, again, we're looking at the problem because if we... If we can see the source of the problem, we know it's a problem, but if we can see the source of the underlying source of the problem, then we can correct it, right? And when you're talking with people, when you are doing your From Sickness to Health, Carol, and other chat people, when you're doing it, you need to make sure that people not only just get the information, right, but they have an understanding. Because we like to say, quoting from Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all thy getting, get what? Understanding. So we want to make sure that we not only give them the wisdom of what happened and what the research says, we want to give them understanding. But the understanding is not just from the research. Understanding is something deeper than that, isn't it? The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the holy is understanding. So we have to look at it through God's eyes and through his lens. He gave a certain diet. When you don't do that diet, bad things happen. Yeah? So let's play the video and see if we can... It's the next slide. And here's the video. Yeah, here we go. I spent time with him and saw that he looked tired, not himself. Got all pale and weak. And then... Uh... I got all these letters from the, you know, the doctor crowd saying, yeah, it's normal because fools like you won't do what you're supposed to do because you don't eat like you should, you don't exercise like you should. The doctor said it was a mechanical failure of the bypass and he needed stents to open the blocked artery. I got so lucky they were able to put those two stents in, you know, and and fix an artery that had been, it was pretty bent and ugly. The goal of the treatment, and Listen. I think it will be achieved, is for President Clinton to resume his uh, very active lifestyle. Uh, this was not a result of um, either his lifestyle or his diet, which have been excellent. But Dr. Dean Ornish didn't see it that way. And so I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, the friends that mean the most to me are the ones that tell me what I need to hear, not necessarily what I want to hear. And you need to know that your genes are not your fate. That, and I say this not to blame you, but to empower you. And I'm happy to work with you to whatever extent you, you want to move forward in that way. And we met a few days later, and he said he was ready to do it. I essentially concluded that I had just played Russian roulette because even though I had changed my diet some and cut down on the caloric 
total of my ingestion and cut back on how much of the high cholesterol food I was eating, I still, without any scientific basis to support what I did, was taking in a lot of extra cholesterol without knowing whether my body would produce enough of the enzyme to dispose of it. And clearly it didn't, or I wouldn't have had that blockage. So that's when I Next made slide. the decision to really change. I should have done it after the surgery. Next slide. Now, did you hear it? Did you hear it? A few things you should have heard and taken notice of. He's, the doctor said, the doctor said, now what kind of doctors are these? Now, I don't say that facetiously or to be, to make fun of them or to mock them. I'm saying, what kind of doctors work with presidents? The answer I'm looking for is the best. The best of the best. That's why they typically live a long time. They're getting the best health care you can get anywhere. When they're president of the United States of America, they of the, 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 the leader of the free world, they are getting the absolute best. And the best of the best stood before the American people in the world and said it was not as a result of his lifestyle or his diet, yet everyone knew that Bill Clinton often even would send out secret service to McDonald's for him. That's a fact. So you see what the underlying problem is. The problem is misinformation. Confuses people and causes people to get sicker and sicker. And that was the case with Bill Clinton. The second thing you should have heard and noticed in that video was it said, <clears throat> or Bill Clinton said, he said that I cut back on some of those things. So McDonald's came out of his diet. And in another interview he did, he said, I just ate fish. But, but, even though he was eating healthy fish, his arteries continued to clog after he got the stents. And he had to go back in. And then Dean Orner says, the only way you're going to solve this problem, you got to cut it all off. Bill Clinton is here today, and he's healthier because he recognizes that his heart is fearfully and wonderfully made. And no matter how you slice it, if you keep feeding it the things that don't work for it, it will cause you problems. Now, what am I saying to you? Am I telling you, am I telling you what to eat? Did I say what you should eat? We always have to say that, Carol. We're never telling you what to do. You're smart people. I'm providing the information. You're processing it and you'll make a decision for yourself based on what you've heard, right? Right? Oh, yeah, I've, I've lost you guys. Was it, the, was it my mention of fish? <laughs> Medical schools, let me give you the other problem. Go back. We went ahead, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to mention here. Medical schools, here, right here in your own state. Medical schools offering a single nutrition in, single course in nutrition is down 37%. That was a few years ago. I'm not sure where it is now, but here's the problem, Carol. The problem is, is that doctors, the reason why a doctor like the one <clears throat> that was working with Bill Clinton, although he may have been an excellent physician, an excellent cl clinician, however, they don't get nutrition as a part of their training. They don't get it. And in fact, it was this study, Bill, it was a bill introduced by the California State Legislature to mandate nutritional education for physicians, but that bill was killed by the medical, California Medical Association. The mandate was stating that at least 12 hours of nutrition training at any time over the next four years. The CMA opposed it along with California Academy of Family Physicians. The bill was amended from a mandatory minimum of 12 hours to seven hours, and then it went all the way down to zero. Zero. Z with an O, zero. You just said it. You just said it. They have very powerful lobbies. They're like the mafia. All of it, cahoots. It's an industry. You are good business when your heart is bad. You're good business. Right? I'm, I hate to say it, but that's the truth. 
Dr. Um, Michael Greger said, and I love this statement, he says, you know, that, that old adage, a doctor, I mean, uh, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. Remember that? And he reversed it. He said, a doctor day will keep the apple away. In other words, you won't get the nutrition from the doctor. Next slide. Uh, let's bring this home. I'm going to tell you all a story in a minute as we close. So, <clears throat> This little fact, the global burden of disease study, this was a part of my presentation yesterday, identified the typical American diet as the primary cause of Americans' death and disability. Next slide. One, more than 100,000 lives per year could be saved if people just ate their fruits and veggies according to the dietary guidelines. And here's um, one final video before we're going to switch up there to that other presentation. Uh, here is a video. This is from my television show called From Sickness to Health. Um, it's a video, but I like this video. I like to show it because it really brings home the point, even though my hair was a little darker back then. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 states, Trust in the Lord with Can we try the next all thy slide? heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. Hello, Go to the next slide. and welcome to the program. This is from Sickness to Health. Okay, it, the problem is, is it's showing the whole video rather than where I wanted it to go. Mm. What's the name of that video? It's from Sickness to Health. There it is. That's what I want to see. Yeah, I want to see the conversation between me and the doctor when he's demonstrating. Cardiac arrest. Everyone who has looked at this subject seriously, down from the Surgeon General to uh, William Castelli from the Framingham study and several of all of the researchers, same conclusion. 70 to 80 percent or more of the heart problems we're having hmm? would cease to exist if folks were having a reasonable diet. So what's an unreasonable diet? And what happens? What is this? You've got some props here. That's very exciting to me. You've got some glob here. What is this thing here? Well, this here is five pounds of fat. Ooh! <laughs> my, my. It, this is so heavy. You mean to tell me if someone has five pounds of fat in their body, it's as heavy as this? How does someone get this in their body? Please explain. <laughs> <laughs> this all comes from what comes through here. Okay. Whoa. The food we eat, coupled with the exercise we do not have, mm -hmm. directly leads to this little issue here. As we look at uh, the obesity trends in America, we have found some very interesting things. The, the map has just gradually lit up in terms of the percentage of overweight and obese the population. Mm -hmm. So much so that the average seat that we sit on now is 22 inches wide. It used to be 100 years ago, 17 inches. So it went from 17 inches to 22. To make accommodation for or increasing girth. So people are getting bigger. It is. And um, the most serious trend is that children, the obesity uh, rates in children are off the, off the scale. Wow. Is, is it wow. possible so, to fast forward that so to just the, uh, the test tubes? Fat. It's let's, just let's a little make bit. This real practical for people. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was sharing with someone. Yeah, yeah, just at the beginning of that. Beginning, go back a little more. Back a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go with, um, this is um, the small size of french no, fries. No, it, it's still a little further before. Just a little bit. That's the amount of fat in a small serving of french fries. Hold up, hold up. This, this is mind blowing to me. Major. Small serving of french fries. Hold up, hold up. this, this is mind blowing That's to me. This is a small serving of french fries. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about like when they are extra super sized in some way. Mm. This is the smallest version smallest that you can get. And it fills up a complete test tube right there. Mm. You know, the but, but I, I want to make sure that we understand this because, you know, someone said, well, that's a small test tube of fat. 
How could this be a bad thing? But you're saying it is. It is, because that has to go somewhere. And as you study the circulations, we find out that they land up in the process. Of course, it goes to the liver and then from there on, but it lands up many times in these arteries, the cholesterol the, um, and the fats land up somewhere. So when you're going in as a, as a surgeon and you're looking, now most people are, have never looked inside of a heart. You do mm -hmm. it every day, all day, all the time, yes? Uh -huh. we do. And what you're seeing is the stuff that we don't think is actually going anywhere except into our stomach is ending up in our hearts and is causing major, major problems. You are what you eat. Garbage in, garbage out. Mercy. Quality in, quality out. Take a look at this one. This is for one hot dog. W what kind of a hot dog? A dead dog. <laughs> <laughs> a dead dog, hot dog. Okay. And, and here's my favorite. Here's this my one's, favorite. This one's coming out the thing. It's, it's, it's coming. Yeah. But how about the quarter pound cheeseburger? A quarter pounder of cheeseburger. Here is the, the fat in a quarter pound cheeseburger. I'm going to need your help. Help me there. Okay. And that, and that, and that. I'm sorry, you, you mean one of these? That's All three. This is three quarter, quarter pounders of cheese. One serving. One this is one pound. serving. A quarter pound cheeseburger. You know what? I'm going to hold these right here. Let's, because there are a lot of people on the street. There are a lot of people on the street who are actually eating this, and they don't know what we're talking about. So let's go hear from them and come there. back and finish the discussion. Let's take a listen. Make the switch now. What do y'all think of that? I love that very practical example. Go to the other one and I'm going to talk to you about Kelly Perkins. Kelly Perkins who was somebody who had a heart situation. There you go. And we're going to go down to, uh, I can tell you the slide. It's a presentation that I give and it's a wonderful story. Uh, we'll pick up the story at sli slide number um, slide number six. She wrote a book called The Climb of My Life. There it is. There it is. Thank you. So she tells this amazing story in her book, The Climb of My Life. Um, and she actually authorized the use of her story. Next slide. It says that basically what would you do if you knew your heart was dying? That was a question that she raises in the book. What would you do if you knew your heart was dying, right? Um, that is what happened to Kelly Perkins at age 30, at age 30. Kelly had an active life and loved hiking with her boyfriend, Craig, whom she later married. Next slide. That's a picture of them on one of their many hikes. They love to do that. Then at age 30, at age 30, believe it or not, Kelly contracted a virus that attacked her heart muscle, causing serious damage known as cardiomyopathy. That was her issue. So she was faced with her active lifestyle, her adventurous lifestyle, being completely upended, and she was going to die. Next slide. She became so weak. That one. You're on the right one. She became so weak that her husband, Craig, had to carry her around the house even. This mysterious condition seemed to be draining her of her very life. Would it ever end? Was there any hope? She wondered. Next slide. So Kelly needed a new heart. She was put on a transplant list after three years of waiting, her moment had come. There was no more internal debate. Kelly knew she could not go on in her present state. Next slide. So a donor heart was available to Kelly, and she received the gift of a new healthy heart. Amen? Kelly needed this gift made available at such a tragic cost. Mm. A woman had just died in a terrible car crash. Her heart was preserved for Kelly. After she got this new heart, next slide, she started walking 10 to 15 minutes, several times a day. Soon, 
They were climbing hills and carrying packs. It's like old times. Next slide. Within 10 months of her surgery, Kelly climbed the easier backside of Half Dome. Anybody know what Half Dome is? You heard about it's right here in your, your own state, Yosemite Park. She did that. Next slide. Kelly always climbs with her heart monitoring equipment and anti rejection medication so that there are no issues. She always hydrates with plenty of waters. There you go. Next slide. That's needed. As part of her healing journey, Kelly focuses on healthy food choices and maintaining a thankful attitude, wouldn't you? When your life is preserved and you're given another opportunity. Within 10 months, next slide, within 10 months of her surgery, no, that's not what I want. As a part of her healing journey, no, that one, that one, 10 years after her first trek on the backside of Half Dome, she technically climbed the 2,000 foot sheer face of Half Dome. So she did the whole thing. She was 46 years old, next slide, when this happened. And she's quoted as saying in her book, I chose Half Dome because it's broken in half, but it still stands strong. That was sort of symbolic for her. Broken in half, but it still stands strong. Physically, I feel I'm stronger than ever before, she said, even before. Next slide. With her new heart, Kelly has been able to achieve her mountaintop experience. In closing, your heart, your inner motives and desires, the springboard of your actions, your inborn or fleshly nature, but God gives a promise, doesn't he? He says, I'll give you what? A new heart. And you know, this is not just spiritual. Well, it's not just physical. It's both. God will give you, when you make the choice, he'll give you a new heart. You can actually reverse heart disease and actually... Go to the next slide. Here's a few texts for you. Next slide. I like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. We talked about that this weekend. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish, we are told. Next slide. Jesus is the light, the true light, which enlightens every man coming into the world. Next slide, when we glimpse God's great heart of love, we see our own heart, sickness, sin, and need. And this is the final slide that I want you to see. He says and promises, I will remove your stony heart and replace it with a heart that's God-willed, not self-willed. He'll give us a new heart. When we actually follow him, a new heart he'll give you. If you take on the health principles that he has given us, a new healthy heart. He'll restore your heart. And science shows that most people don't know this, chat folks. Most people don't know that you can reverse heart disease. You can reverse diabetes. You can reverse these things. But like Bill Clinton, most people, hear me out, are receiving a death sentence. This is what you got. Here's the drug for it. That's not God's way. God's way says, change your lifestyle, change your outcome or your outlook, and you'll change your outcome. And in the meantime, I'll give you a new spiritual heart as well. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Give me the, yeah, any questions? Questions? I knew somebody was going to bring that oil back up. I knew it. <laughs> Rapeseed oil and olive oil? But cooked or, or cold, just like in the Cold stove. press. Cold press. It's always best because it's not processed or heated. When you heat, up, when you heat up oils, it actually changes the molecular structure of that oil, and that is not good. So it's better to actually have a, an oil that's cold pressed. Extra virgin. Oh. Right, yeah. Heat the oil up, you're going to change the molecular structure. It's, yeah. 
Even the high heat ones changes the molecular structure. Those are better. But I don't, I don't want to, it's, it's again, you have to have a lifestyle where you're not doing this all the time. There are people who fry every day. Yeah. And nothing's good unless it's fried. I mean, you go down through the South and everything is fried. Even ice cream is fried. In New Orleans, it is. They have fried ice cream. That's a, that's a popular thing. Yeah, you saute your vegetables, do it with water. You don't have to do it with oil. But, you know, occasionally there are things that you will actually fry. Use a better oil and don't do it all the time. And make sure you don't have a sedentary lifestyle and you're exercising. Get that fat out when <laughs> you exercise. Any other questions? Yes? You know... You're talking about like earth balance. You know, I, we, we have this scale of good, better, best. It's better. It's better. It's not best though, you know? I believe that we're gonna enter into a time where we're just gonna have to do the simple things. Very, very simple. And that's, that's always make that your goal, simple. I just recently did a 11-day mm, fast of all raw. I like to do that occasionally, you know? Just a big salad. I make my own salad dressing from lemon juice, garlic, and salt, like what you all had yesterday for the potluck. Very simple, right? Lemon is a natural liver detox. It's good for the, you know, making the body alkaline, right? So I have a good thing, and then I got all the greens and the colorful vegetables and so forth. And then I just did a handful of nuts. Um, I had my mangoes, right, in the morning. Um, so I kept it real, real simple. Um, nothing cooked. And it was, um, I did it for a reason, both for health, but also to just sort of condition the mind to be simple. Just to be simple, you know? Because sometimes people like, you know, I have, I have a friend that I was sharing with and sh she would cook for her father and I showed her how to make, um, you know, I do this, this talk on collard greens and kale, a love story. <laughs> and it's how when you combine collard greens and kale, you know, you have this power-packed sort of green vegetable, amazing side dish with coconut, not oil, but with coconut milk and ginger. And it's amazing. And she started making it. She loved it. But her father was like, is there any meat in that? And she says, no, 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 he's in his, you know, he's very, very sickly. He's in his 80s, though, but he's very, very debilitated. And he, he said, I'm not eating that unless it has meat in it. <laughs> Some people are that way. I'm just not going to eat it, even though it was, like, delicious. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I... He's, talking, he's asking about coffee enemas. I don't really want to get in that. I want to just st stay the focus on health and heart and not treatments. So uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lecture for another time. Yes? Say that you're working on developing a habit of general coffee, or is that a reason? Developing a what? Some kind of this. Oh, documentary, yes. We, we just. general coffee? I work for the Hope Channel. That's the other thing I do, other than the ministry. I work for Hope Channel as a producer. Okay. So I'm potentially going to be producing um, a documentary on uh, the Blue Zones from the Adventist perspective. We've had it done about us. There have been different things about us, but we've never really like dug in and show really why we're living so long and really get into it and not have it be like a byword or just a uh, you know, an honorable mention. Oh, yeah, and they keep the side. But, but anyway, Sardinia, they drink wine, you know. So we want to, like, really focus on that and show there's something to it. And what I like most, the thing that drives me most is the fact that, as I mentioned, Okinawa, Japan, longest living women, longest living men in Sardinia, Italy. But in Loma Linda, you know what's different? Anyone? Both genders? All, all diverse. All diverse. One national group. Revelation chapter 14. 
every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And see, that, that needs to be told because that then, what does that do? It will actually bolster our core belief in this three angels' message. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, it was it wasn't the very first slide. It was further into the presentation. That's Dr. Dean Ornish. One of them is undo it, and the other one is reversing heart disease. D Dr. Dean Ornish. Yes, my sister. Yes, um, the answer to that is, uh, or the question is, for those who didn't hear it, the question is being asked here in the sanctuary, um, are there benefits to whether you have the collards, kales, or the different greens cooked or raw? And the answer is, you get different benefits from things being raw or cooked. So you can do both. The conventional wisdom is that you would do 80% raw, 20% cooked. So in other words, you have a big salad and then you have your cooked items, your heated items. Um, but say for instance, like, you know, tomatoes. Tomatoes raw, um, the, that very gelatinous kind of film that's around the seeds, it actually reduces blood platelets and actually is good for your heart, raw cook a tomato, and the sauce is good for a man's prostate. See, so both are good. And you'll find that kale raw can boost your immune system, and then kale cooked does a whole nother thing. So it's like, like for me, when I make my collars and kales with coconut and ginger, I cook it just enough that it's soft and supple. But then I also like kale in my salad. So I get both, the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. No, jump right in. Well, I, I do 80% raw all the time anyway, so I, didn't have, I don't have to ease into it. I just, that's just what I do. So I was just like, you know, I had something coming up, you know, wanted my mind to be clear, wanted to just take that break. You really give the system a stomach, I mean, give the stomach a, a, a rest, your system a rest. Uh, um, and um, in addition to that, when you do a, a lot of really good fiber raw, you stimulate something in the microbiome called butyrate. It's a chemical uh, signal that sends, goes throughout the body and it reduces inflammation naturally. Naturally. Yeah, yep. Yes, Gwen.
Wow. Thank you so much. I'm going to summarize that for those who are watching. Uh, Gwen here, who is 91 years of age, was just sharing how um, in the assisted living facility in Santee, how she is still being an evangelist. She's still being a health evangelist and sharing. They're exercising with people, sharing information, but can't quite convince the, um, the, the chef to make healthy meals for everyone is challenging for her, but she's going to take the chat. Did you hear what I just said? She's going to take the chat training because she wants to get more in the information. She wants to equip herself further to be able to help others. Now, you are an inspiration. I'm so glad you shared that because this morning, I, <clears throat> uh, the church was very kind enough, pastor uh, was, uh, and the health team here was kind enough to put me up in the Paradise Village assisted living facility, which is very nice. Yes. It's quite nice. I am very comfortable there. They have a little cafeteria. I'm sorry. The Paradise Village, right by the hospital. Anyway, so I have a, a room there, and I go down, and I get breakfast, and I watch, you know, the, the residents come, and they get their breakfast, and they, they have lunch, and they have a good social time, and I'm, I'm looking around, and I'm like, oh, it, this is very nice because they have a very social support system here and that's good so no one's lonely and I watch they all speak to each other good morning and they know each other's names and then I watched their what was being served to them and I said wow you know I saw the cheesy cheesy this cheesy that I saw the the, the bacon you know and I said wow they don't know that you know <clears throat> the quality of life we're not really so much about the years the years are nice, but the quality of life. But, and I watch the ones who come and they can barely walk. And I know they don't, they don't have the same age as, say, you, Gwen, or you, John. They don't. They're younger. And they can't really walk. And um, they can't maneuver. And, and, you know, there's kind of a, you know, you look in their eyes and there's kind of nothing there. And they're on their way on that downward spiral. So anyway... It's good to have evangelists in the assisted living facilities as well. So God bless you for that. Anybody else? Anybody else? This was clear as mud. Oh, yeah. The cruciferous vegetable, cruci, R-U-X, is the Latin word for cross. F-E-R-O-U-S is bearing, bearing. So it's cruciferous, is cross-bearing. And all cruciferous vegetables, when they flower, they actually flower in the shape of a cross. So this is not something that was arbitrarily named for it. It actually grows in the shape of a cross, and that's why it got its name, cruciferous cross-bearing. But then what is so beautiful for us is that 
that is the very vegetable that was added after sin. You understand? And then for me, a beautiful object lesson is the way that the cabbage itself, the head of cabbage, the way it grows, the next time you have some cabbage, take one leaf and pull it back, and then pull back the next one. And notice that it's going to keep going in this pattern of a cross. If that doesn't help you to believe in something deeper than it being just about food, then I don't know what to tell you. Anything else? Any other questions? Oh, the chat training. I think as, when I stop, I'm going to allow Carol to come back up and just kind of let people know one more time, because maybe some other people joined uh, by, um, by live stream. And um, she'll give some more information about people, because she's recruiting people. She's recruiting people to come, take this training, and let's build an army of people. Whether you are in the school, whether you're on your job, whether you are at the assisted living facility, we all have a work to do, and we can reach people for Jesus. Amen? Carol. Oh, I want to just say this is my last meeting, so thank you all for coming. Thank you who joined this live stream. May God bless you, and may you stay healthy. Stay close to Jesus. Yes, you can buy them. You've heard it. Um, it's between you and God now. If you are interested in taking the chat online training, it's $220 because we have over 20 people. It's about $400 if you're an individual. Um, see me afterwards. We'll tell you how to get online. It's, everything is online. It's at your own pace. It is uh, 60 hours of training, so that's what chat is. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer your questions. And is there any general question? And then I can have Pastor close us out with prayer, or someone else close us out with prayer. My friend Rick, I'm going to ask Rick to close us out with prayer. Just a moment. Okay, any questions? All right, go forth with God. He's going to do something remarkable in your lives, and just watch for it. Watch for it. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the blessings you've given us today and how to make our life healthier and how we can turn that into getting us closer to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, El Cajon Church. You are the bastion of support for this. When I looked at the list of all the 10 churches that have people, you by far have the most people who have signed up and are taking the online training. I mean, so you are our headquarters. You are our home base. There are 10 churches of us represented here, but you're home base for us. Thank you all. May God bless you.